So I'd much rather hear your voices than mine. So I will have lots of uh, opportunity for lots of questions at the end. Um, and how to boil down in a half hour something that's pretty much fascinated me my entire life, but I'll do it. Um, you know, the Charleston Renaissance, just taking um, the term from the other Renaissance, obviously, you know, Renaissance, Renaissance, you know, rebirth, you know, think of the Italian Renaissance. Um, so obviously, to understand the Renaissance, you have to understand that there was a death, you know, and there was a rebirth. Um, so um, oftentimes when I talk to, um, like, elder hostel groups, if they come to Charleston, I actually tell them, tell me the things that you, you know, you've been in Charleston five minutes or a day or something like that. Tell me the things that Charleston, that really appeal to you about Charleston, and just immediately present themselves. And I, you know, it's like a parlor trick. I write it down on a little index card. And I pretty much tell them that by the end of the lecture, I'm pretty much going to prove my point that almost everything that you think about Charleston today, you know, was pretty much invented or came to pass or somehow came to fruition during the Charleston Renaissance. You know, people talk about the old buildings, people talk about um, how polite people are, people talk about, um, you know, how clean the city is and that kind of thing. And I basically say, you know, if it was not for the period of the Charleston Renaissance, that period roughly, you know, maybe say between World War I and World War II, there's no exact beginning, there's no exact end, the city that we have today would not be here. Um, the Preservation Society would not be here. Um, the Preservation Society being part of the Charleston Renaissance as well. Um, so we wouldn't be here today, that too. A lot of times I like to think of it as sort of like an hourglass. You know, um, that little time period was really just you know, maybe 20 years or so in Charleston's history. And you think about what an hourglass does. Everything comes in through a narrow little funnel. And when it comes out, it's completely upside down. So, you know, last night I understand you did the walled city. So obviously, you know, Charleston founded in 1670. Charleston, before the Revolutionary War, was a very cultured city. Um, you know, um, you think in the 19th century, Audubon, um, natural history, um, you know, before the Civil War, you know, Charleston was starting to stagnate, but um, truly at the end of the Civil War, you know, that's when, you know, everything died. 1865 is sort of like, you know, the death knell for Charleston. Do you all know the great um, um, Oscar Wilde story about the city of Charleston? Actually true. Um, Oscar Wilde visits Charleston in 1882. He's on his American tour, um, going across the country, speaking about art for art's sake. And he speaks at the Academy of Music, which is now the Riviera Theater. And, um, and he gives his lecture, and then he goes walking on Charleston's battery. Um, and it's a full moon, it's a gorgeous evening. Um, he swears, and of course this didn't happen, but he did tell the story about Charleston. He managed to sum up Charleston in an epigram um, only having been here about a day or two. So he's walking on the battery, he says, he looks at the full moon, he sees Charlestonians passing by, and he talks about how beautiful the full moon's reflection is on the water, and he swears that Charlestonians turned to him and said, you should have seen it before the war. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's in, it's in all the Oscar Wilde biographies, so Oscar Wilde did tell this story about Charleston. So that gives you the idea that the mythology you know, that Charleston was more beautiful before the Civil War, that everything died in 1865, the clock stopped, you know, was pretty much, you know, sort of um, understood at the time that Charleston and was an embittered place. If you came to Charleston in 1900, John Bennett, um, a children's author who moved from here from Ohio in 1865, um, wrote his memoir, or wrote down, when he came to Charleston in 1898, he was the first Yankee that, that people had ever seen you know, Sam Gilliard Stoney, that, you know, considered Mr. Charleston, was a little boy at the time. He came up to John Bennett to see if they really did have, if Yankees really did have horns and um, tails. Um, John Bennett told the fact there were no American flags flown in the city of Charleston at the time, that old ladies put stamps, the George Washington stamp, upside down on their letters, you know, as a sign of distress. Um, that when, that when tourists walk, you know, Yankee steamers, you know, would come in and people would come out, that um, people would literally throw bricks over the walls to try to hit people on the head. But um, John Bennett said Yankees, tourists were not wanted. They did not like how people walked around and looked at the city of Charleston. Charleston really was sort of an embittered place. Um, anything bad in the city of Charleston was called the Yankee. When evaporated milk was introduced to the city of Charleston in 1901, they called it Yankee milk. Um, I mean, 
mean, they really, Charleston was, you know, it, it had been very grand, as it, like in the Oscar Wilde anecdote, and truly it, they felt that culture had died. You look around the city and you see, you know, in 1876 or so, they put up that statue to William Gilmore Sims or so on the Battery, a little after that. 1901, they're putting that statue up in Washington Park to Henry Timrod, the poet laureate of the Confederacy. They really do think culture has died. They're really bitter. They're staying away from the rest of the country. You know, in 1901, 192, you know, the exposition where the Citadel is, is put up, that actually fails abysmally. Um, Charleston is really um, shuttered and closed. In 1905 or so, Henry James visits the city of Charleston. Um, he's visiting Owen Wister, who's, who's, who's honeymooning here, and he writes, Owen Wister writes the novel Lady Baltimore here. Henry James visits the city of Charleston, and he says it's a very feminine city. He said there are no men at all on the street. It's as if the men are still on the battlefield. Um, you know, he talks about um, you know seeing one of the um, piazza doors open, um, and he can almost like look down into the past. He sees Charleston as a very sort of fragile lotus floating on the water, like he sees Fort Sumter in the distance. Um, it's a very feminine city. There is nothing going on here. It's still a city of the defeated. Um, and so then Charleston really is away from the mainstream of the rest of the country. Um, you know, so Charleston is basically, you know, killed in one war, the Civil War, and it's the irony that it's World War I that starts reviving the city of Charleston and starts bringing on the Charleston Renaissance. Um, you know, when the war is declared in 1917, um, there is already a Navy base in the city of Charleston. It's been on the outskirts since about 1901 or so. The Navy base is used as a port of embarkation. Um, it's also where hospital ships are now coming in. So all of a sudden, more people are coming to the city of Charleston. Outsiders are coming in. Um, the, you know, there's the opportunity to raise the American flag, to unite against a common foe. So Charlestonians are feeling to some extent that they are you know, joining the rest of the country. Um, so that movement is happening at the same time. But at the same time, too, the South is being ridiculed. Many of y'all have probably heard of H.L. Mencken, you know, called the Sage of Baltimore, um, you know, who was really the most culture, the, the well, the most well-known cultural critic of his time. In 1917, the same time that um, you know World War One is starting to wake Charleston up a little bit, um, he he writes this essay called "The Sahara of the Beaux Arts," and not B E A U X space A R T S. He calls it the Sahara of the Beaux Arts, B O Z A R T S, like Bozo, Bozo. And he ridicules the South. He says he says the South does not have a symphony orchestra. There is nothing cultural that has come from the South in decades. Um, he's, he compares it to the um, the vacuity of space. He says you know there is you know he said you know the whole of Europe can fit in the South, and there is nothing coming from the American South at all. And, um, and he's pretty much right, and that's why people are very offended. Um, um, you know, even in the 1930s, um, President Roosevelt calls you know, the South the problem of the country. So after the Civil War, the, the South is really culturally dead. Charleston, in particular, is licking its wounds. But something starts to happen about World War I. If you think what's happening, um, if nothing else, Europe is close to the wealthy. Um, think about the Florida land boom starting. The Cooperative Bridge has not been built yet, but people are still having to pass through Charleston to get to Florida. So you have all these northerners coming south, passing, you know, they're not coming here, they're passing through Charleston, and the city that they see is really remarkable. You know, it's like the Sleeping Beauty kind of thing. And, you, and there, if you see the photographs of what Charleston looked like at the time, um, you know, there were unpaved streets. Because Charleston has been so poor, no one has torn down any buildings, there has been no need to tear down buildings. Um, you know, so the city is sort of, um, you know, you know, like a uh, fly in amber, just stuck in the past, and but slowly waking up. An analogy that I often use is like weather, and this time of year in particular. You know, when a hot and a cold front come together, there's turbulence, and this is what was going on in the American South, and it was specifically going on in the city of Charleston. If you think about what's happening in Charleston in the 19 teens and 20s. Um, there are still African Americans alive who remember slavery, um, but you know Edwin Augustus Charleston, um, you know, founds the local branch of the NAACP in 1919 at the same time as well. Um, there are still old ladies who remember, you know, dancing as young girls on the walls of Fort Sumter, you know, when they thought the South was going to be invincible. Um, but now there are also flappers, you know, dancing the Charleston 
um, around the country. So there really is a sort of, you know, it's um, John Bennett again in 1919, you know, he's the fellow that I quoted who moved to Charleston in 1898, born in Ohio, marries into a blue blood um, family. In 1919, he writes his children, um, um, sons, old Charleston is gone and a strange loud day rolls in. He can actually see the sort of the future advancing down the street. You can sort of look behind you and you know and see the past um, retreating as this strange new day rolls in. And like I said, it's hot and cold colliding. That there's this world, this world of change all of a sudden going on. Charleston has not changed for generations. All of a sudden, there's new people moved to town because of World War One. There are very wealthy people coming to town, um, buying new house, buying houses, sometimes demolishing them. You know, the house right next to St. Michael's, the Burroughs House on Broad Street is taken down and moved away somewhere else. I think a room of it is in winter tour these days. Um, and Charleston starts becoming known as a tourist city as well, too. Um, so, you know, the um, historic Charleston Foundation, you know, that gas station is built. Um, you know, houses are torn down. Um, 1925, the Francis Marion Hotel is built. Um, it's actually um, named by DeBose Hayward's mother contest on naming of the Francis Marion Hotel. The Fort Sumter house is, is house is um, you know, condominium. That hotel is built at the same time too. So you know for generations people have been trying to figure out what's going to revive the economy of the city of Charleston. And you know the city fathers are always trying to figure it out. And it's this and it's the women of the city of Charleston who finally figure out you know what's going to save the city of Charleston. And it's people like Sue Frost who found the Preservation Society. You know, these ladies have been thinking it's nice, they're saving the Manigo House, that kind of thing. But they finally realized, and they convinced the city fathers, that preservation is not just sweet, it's not just a good idea, but it's actually good business. And Tom Stoney, who was at that point the youngest mayor of the city of Charleston, he's the one that coined the phrase, America's most historic city. Um, and he literally goes around the country sponsoring Charleston contests. Um, you know, the dance to Charleston, to try to get people talking about Charleston, coming to Charleston. And it's this new energy, you know, as these died in the world Charlestonians seeing change all of a sudden rapidly hitting the city. That's what really sparked the cultural movement called the Charleston Renaissance, where all of a sudden people start realizing the past is disappearing, and if we don't do something about it, it's going to vanish totally. So people like Sue Frost and a variety of people like that, they are literally trying to save the buildings. You know, you know, as development comes, as hotels are built, um, they realize they're killing the goose that lays the golden egg by tearing down these old buildings. Um, but what these other artists are doing, who, who, you know, who are responsible for coining the phrase the Charleston Renaissance, they see the old ways changing as well. You know, we think about DeBose Hayward, who wrote the novel Porgy, um, you know, which is probably the most famous cultural um, um, artifact coming from the city of Charleston. You know, and the first line of Porgy is, in an ancient beautiful city that time forgot before it destroyed, you know, this story happened. So, you know, Hayward sees all of a sudden blacks are starting to change. They're not the subservient um, servants anymore. You know, they've gone away, they've been to Europe. You know, I said Harleston has founded the, the local branch of the NAACP. They see this whole world is starting to change. I mean, Elizabeth Elmer Werner, again, too, you know, sees that um, it's trying to change. So they're, you know, it's almost, they're almost trying to capture the moment as it's vanishing. And it's not unusual for this to happen. Apparently, scholars note um, it happens in a variety of eras. You know, right in these moments of change is when these cultural events really start happening. You know, these dynamic moments of change is sometimes there's something, there's sort of like a gestalt in the society that, you know, that triggers this sort of, you know, and not just in one person, but in the variety of people that all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden the arts flourish. Think of the Renaissance itself. You know, if you compare it back to the Renaissance, the Dark Ages are ending, new ideas are coming in. You know, it sparks this incredible excitement and, and this burst of creativity. So, um, so that's basically what's happening in Charleston. And it's taking, you know, a variety of formats. And again, it is, you know, the past colliding with the future um, and creating this sort of tension among a variety of people. And, you know, they, some are moved by poetry, to 
move it in poetry, some are, you know, do it by um, art. So the people that come out of there, it's really interesting, you know, um, many of us are probably familiar with the Bloomsbury's, you know, um, you know, Virginia Woolf and a variety of all these people that lived within the same neighborhood in London, and all of a sudden again, in these same interwar years between like World War I and World War II, all of these very creative people, Lytton Strachey, um, you know, um, Vanessa Bell, Virginia Woolf, all these people just started to write and paint. And you think the same sort of thing is happening here in Charleston. And the, the incredible thing about here is that they're all within a few blocks of each other, literally around the corner from each other, and many of them are actually related to each other as well, too. So you think about DeBose Hayward, he's born in 1885, 20 years after the Civil War, um, you know, and he writes his novel, Porgy, based on 89 to 91 Church Street, you know, Catfish Row, right next door to the Hayward Washington House, which is one of the first houses that's saved in the city of Charleston. Um, so you see how this is all coming together. Um, you know, just down the street is Alice Ravenel, Hugh G. Smith. You know, if anyone's got a Charleston pedigree, you know, knows <laughs> you know, has got enough syllables. Um, and she too, but again, she has never, she has rarely left Charleston. People have come to her and taught her. You know, she's more interested in the moods of the marshes and that kind of thing. Um, so she's starting to capture that. And, and, you know, and then there are people like Elizabeth O'Neill Werner. But you have to realize as well, too, one reason, and, and, and it's a sort of vicious cycle, they can paint and they can sell their paintings because they're tourists coming to town to buy their paintings. Um, and so then it's, it's a very delicate balance, which is, I guess, what the Preservation Society and all tourism is dedicated to, is trying to keep that delicate balance between preserving the city and commercializing it. But these people are making money off of the tourists. And you know, one book in particular, um, uh, Stephanie Ewell's um, The Making of Historic Charleston, A Golden Haze of Memory, um, she really does pretty much um, um, basically, again, prove the point that the city that we know today was really created you know, in the idea of the, you know, in this time period between World War I and World War II. You know, the idea that we have of Charleston being America's most historic city, um, Charleston being the leader in the preservation movement, um, you know, it all gels in this time as well. Um, so again, so Alice Smith is painting these beautiful watercolors. Elizabeth Elmer Werner is doing, um, you know, her etchings. She actually has to support herself. Her husband has died. Um, Alfred Huddy, you know, the, um, one of America's most famous etchers, comes here to start teaching at the Gibbs Museum of Art. At the time, you know, um, he and Mrs. Bernard don't quite get on. They actually, within a point, live with about four houses of each other. Um, but again, they're all producing art that tourists can take away, especially in etchings. You know, you know they're mass producing things. And it's really interesting. So Charleston actually starts getting a national reputation. So, you know, um, Mencken in 1917 making fun of, of the whole South, basically talking about it's the Sahara, the Beaux-Arts, it's a cultural wasteland, um, and you know, um, you know, people passing through Charleston and saying, you know, there's basically, you know, Oscar Wilde talking about that too. So in the 1920s, you know, when the, when the Poetry Society of South Carolina is founded, um, it's the first national, or a statewide organization you know, for poets, and and by 1924. Um, they're actually doing national radio hookups. The Poetry Society of South Carolina, which meets in the Confederate home, founded by DeBose Hayward and John Bennett and Josephine Pinckney and people like that. In the 1920s, poetry was the rage. The Poetry Society was founded. And by the mid-20s, you know, Charleston has gone light years. In the mid-20s, it is giving the largest cash award for poetry you know, in the United States. You know, open to poem, poems, uh, poets throughout the English-speaking world. So, from you know, 1917, 1918, Charleston being made of fun of as being a cultural wasteland. Within four or five years, it is getting national reputation as being the center of this literary renaissance. You know, that's starting to, um, you know, that's starting to open up. 1925, DeBose Hayward's you know novel Porgy is published. In 1927, it becomes a play on Broadway. You know, we all know the story that in 1935, you know, it, the opera opens in New York City. Um, and again, um, Porgy and Bess, probably the most famous cultural icon, you know, you know, you know, to come out of the city of Charleston. 
Um, so all of this is happening in that very intense time period um, between the two wars. You know, while people are seeing change come upon them, they're trying to hold this sort of little um, ghost in their hand to keep it from changing. And um, you know, they're 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 bemoaning the fact that the city is changing. But you know what? They're making money off the fact as well that the city is changing because the tourists are buying it. Charleston has a national reputation now. Um, Julia Peterkin, who lives in Fort Mott, South Carolina, um, um, you know, wins the Pulitzer Prize for fiction in you know 1928 for her novel Scarlet Sister Mary. Um, and the interesting thing is, is that um, you know, the, you know, and you can't talk about Charleston history or Southern history without talking about Black history. Um, the interesting thing is, is that Charleston starts defining itself pretty much in in African American terms. Think about the Elizabeth Elmer Burner drawings, you know, of, of, of women, you know, the flower ladies. Think of Porgy, Porgy and Bess, all about African Americans. Um, and you think about Society for the Preservation of Spirituals. You know, this was a group that started to prevent Negro spirituals from being lost. So you have these white people dressing up, you know, in plantation finery, singing Negro spirituals. They're also, it's really interesting, the whites are seeing how blacks are changing. You know, the blacks are moving off the plantation and um, leaving. Um, and it's very easy for the whites to see how the South is changing. And that many of these whites bemoan the fact how the how black consciousness is changing. So then they try to capture it in their art. But white society is changing as well too. Um, I said um, a lot of famous people are passing through the city of Charleston. We all know the Villa Margarita down on the Battery now being worked on. Um, Sinclair Lewis um, comes to Charleston in the 1920s or 1920 or so, and he's finishing his novel Main Street, which, you know, which wins him um, the Nobel Prize. Um, Carol Kennicott, his main character from Gopher Prairie, in his novel comes stays at the Villa Margarita, um, and and Sinclair Lewis has Carol Kennicott wonder: Is America all of Main Street, or is there some beauty left in America? You know, she glimpses it on Charleston's Battery. And it's that cliched line, you know, that Margaret Mitchell uses at the end of Gone with the Wind, you know, when Rhett Butler leaves um, Scarlet in Atlanta, he goes back to Charleston to see if there's any kind of grace and glory, um, you know, left in the world. So this is what Stephanie is saying in this book, that it's at this time period, you know, that Charleston is sort of inventing itself as, you know, the last repository of true antebellum charm. Um, where you know some traditions still live on, where you don't need money to get ahead, and so then you know there was you know <coughs> Oscar Wilde had heard this myth about Charleston, you know, um, like I said before the War of the Moon, and in this time period, the myth that many of us grew up with in Charleston is actually sort of being invented. You know that Charleston is the last repository of grace and glory. That Charleston is different from the rest of the country. That there's something remarkable about the city that you can't see um, anywhere else. So again, um, tourism, the, you know, tourism is created in the era of the Charleston Renaissance. Um, you know, many national artists pass through the city of Charleston. We give the name the Dance. You know, the Charleston. Um, you know, to this sort of the, the spirit of the jazz age going there. And that's the irony, that this small, southern, very conservative city that once was the personification of the Old South in the 1920s or so, in 1930s, lights the spark to the, to the beginning of the New South. And you think of the southern writers that came later, um, Faulkner, Dora Welty, you know, all of those great southern writers that are truly better than the writers that came from Charleston. Um, but it was in Charleston, you know, Charleston's proud of starting the Civil War, of being the place where that spark started that tore the country apart, that made the country a different thing. In many respects, in, in the Charleston Renaissance, Charleston was also the place where the spark started, um, you know, to start this cultural movement throughout the South, where the South was no longer ashamed of being the South, you know, being told that it was wrong, and the South started glorifying itself and you know, and saying you know it's not bad being southern, it's not bad being Charleston. That you know America has moved so drastically quickly that maybe the South, maybe Charleston, has preserved you know a little bit of that grandeur, a little bit of that taste you know of early America. So I've not quite gone thirty minutes, <laughs> but um, you know I could go on and repeat the same thing. But I would love to have more specific questions. You know maybe about some of the houses or maybe about some particular personalities. Um, 
that I've not mentioned. How were the houses on this tour chosen? I, I haven't read the right. material. Um, and I would defer to the people from Preservation Society. Apparently they did try to choose people that were associated with the Charleston Renaissance. And I know some of the houses, um, one is Eola Willis. Eola Willis was um, a historian. She wrote in the 1920s. She wrote, um, you know, the history of the Charleston stage. She was also responsible, one of the people, sort of responsible for the renovation of the Dock Street Theater. Um, so, you know, there was a shopping list of a variety of people associated with the Charleston Renaissance. And I think what the Preservation Society people did, they tried to find the houses, you know, that were site specific. I think many of y'all have houses on Atlantic Street. Atlantic Street was where many of the painters lived. Um, you know, um, first, you know, we think of Elizabeth O'Meara Burner's studio at 38 Trad, but she was first down on Atlantic Street. Alice Ravenel, Hugh G. Smith lived at 69 Church Street, but she had a studio on Atlantic Street as well. And um, um, let's see, um, um, Anna Hayward Taylor um, also had a studio on, on Atlantic Street. So within like a block, all these women artists, you know, and they were apparently, you know, they were all Southern women, they all knew each other. They all deferred to each other, and they would have open houses, and people would come into their house and sort of, you know, be, you know, have many seeds and stuff like that. And these ladies would sell them their art as well too. So I know many of them are on Atlantic Street. Do other people have particular houses or dresses that they want to ask about? Um, so again, but it really was all here. If you think, um, you know, if you think about Porgy and Bess being the most important <coughs> cultural icon that came, so you think about 89 to 91 Church Street or the Hayward Washington House. You know, that's really the epicenter, and that's pretty much the epicenter of, you know, of all the buildings, I guess, on this tour here. And they really did live within a few blocks from each other, and in many cases, they were cousins. And all of a sudden, you know, I think, you know, you know, maybe, you know, me of my generation, we rebelled against what our parents told us was the status quo. And I think to some extent, all these people did too. They saw their parents worshiping the South and being loyal to a past, and they saw some new wave coming in. So they all, you know, they all kind of rebelled against that, and they all, you know, tried to show the South, you know, in Charleston as they saw it, and not through their parents' eyes. Um, other particular questions? I, yes, I missed her. Sure. Um, poetry society. Poetry society. Met in the society. Well, society Betty home Hall and in the and the, and the Confederate home. They sort of had offices in the Confederate home. Um, you know, but they would have their general meetings, the Poetry Society, um, and they brought in just, they brought in speakers like Gertrude Stein and um, Robert Frost and a variety of people, you know, like that as well. And Amy Lowell, um, Edna St. Vincent Millay, you know, again, and these were the rock stars of their time period, the cultural rock stars. So they brought all these people to Charleston. They generally wrote the Charleston poem as well. Um, Harlan, I'm wondering, did these artists consciously choose to live within such a, a close uh, knit community, or was it coincidence? Or I mean, they were members crazy? of the close. It, it was, you know, again, it's like the Bloomsbury's. You know, they were all related to each other, and they all slept with each other. And I'm not <laughs> <laughs> but truly, these people oh, grew up. Shit. <laughs> these people all grew up, you know, within, you know, within a few blocks of each other and a few decades of each other. And they all had some kind of common experience. They all saw the society flip at this time, and something sparked them. But obviously, having an encouraging environment like a poetry society, where people would meet and encourage each other, and you know, there was also an etcher society, um, and there was also the preservation society. This is truly the era when all these societies are founded in the city of Charleston. Like I said, the preservation society in 1920, the poetry society in 1920. The Etcher Society in like 1922, um, the Society for the Preservation of Negro Spirituals. So beforehand, um, I don't know if people were too poor. You know, they were not getting together for intellectual ideas. You know, the County Library is founded in the late 1920s, you know, as well, or 1930 or so, by Laura Bragg, who's a friend of DeBose Hayward. So it truly is, you know, and we joke today how incestuous Charleston is and how everyone knows each other. But think at this time in particular when you know blacks were certainly disenfranchised you know so they were there but you think about what a small city charleston was and if you know and there's still that issue today you know if you live downtown and if you were a blue blood you were the elite you know you and you all knew each other um and these truly were i mean there were very few people you know alfred huddy was from off 
um, he came every winter, you know, and then went back every summer to, um, to Woodstock, New York. But if you think about all the other leaders, they were pretty much all born here except for John Bennett. You know, Josephine Pinckney, a descendant of, you know, Eliza Lucas Pinckney, um, you know, the Bose Hayward, descendant of Thomas Hayward, you know, the Hayward Washington House signed of the Declaration of Independence. Alice Rabinow, Hugh D. Smith, descended from everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth O. Verner was slightly, um, you know, her family was, you know, they'd been here before the Civil War, but they were Irish and they were Catholic. But still, she grew up on King Street. Um, she grew up on Chalmers Street, you know, so they all were, you know, in many cases, they all went to the same church and were related to each other. Um, so, you know, they, but again, they all were sort of breathing the same air at the same time, and there was something remarkable going on here. Um, you know, that, that stimulated them. Um, you mentioned all of these well-known authors um, that came, and painters, mm -hmm. that came to Charleston, uh, Henry James, right. others that right. came to Charleston and, uh, just prior to that period or during right. that period. And I'm wondering if that stimulated those that were local here to gather and to start to um, publish or show uh, some of their writings and artwork. Uh -huh. I know that when I came to college here in 1964, it was a small city college, and um, I, I came down from Ohio, and uh, some of the young women that I met here were telling, it was a very small college, like a little high school, mm -hmm. and most everyone that came to the college, or that was in college here, was what from Charleston. Charleston. And um, I was a junior. special of 